Hey yeah, folks, it has been a while, but as you can see, I've got something to show. So I got hung up for quite a while um, looking at different ways of doing input systems, especially around some of the FRP uh, kind of techniques. And in the end, I've actually gone for a library called Cells, which you can find in QuickLisp and is fantastic. It's not FRP, but it does a very good job. You can use it to create those kind of event systems, or you can just use it for really um, nice glitch-free state updates. I won't go into too much details now because I've got other things to show, as you can see. So, uh, first thing, let's get some of the non-visual stuff out of the way. Uh, I've been working a little on type inference stuff. Very, very basic. Basically, it's all about when you create a C array or you create a texture, you don't have to specify all the parameters and Kepler will try and, you know, just guess what you're what you're doing. So here's an example. Here is a variable called data, and it's got a load of numbers in it. And then we can say make C array using that data. Oops. And it'll go through and look at the data, and it will try and find the smallest primitive type um, that will fit all of that data in. So all of these numbers are below 255, so they fit in an unsigned byte. There's no negative numbers, so that's okay. Uh, it knows what the dimensions are. Bang, there's your list. This also works for textures, so if you really need to just throw a texture up, there you are, there's a texture 1D already set up on the GPU and ready to go. Now, this is one of these things that's really nice when you're working interactively in the REPL. Not the best behavior when you're trying to do things really fast in the library, but what, as with all these things, you wanna make it fast and then make it fast. That old common list mantra, just go for get this data somewhere, play around until you get the mechanism right, and then you can specify all your types and make things nice and clean and fast. So that's happening. The other thing you can do, oh, actually, let's uh, get texture back. Uh, I haven't actually checked. I can't remember if printmem works on this. Um, okay, it doesn't like immutable textures. Well, let's go and get this C array. I needed to do some um, memory debugging a little while ago. So I've made this little command called printmem. It takes quite a few of the C array and other uh, local and GPU data structures apparently accept textures, so I'll need to update that. And we'll just print out a little, um, little memory dump uh, in a way that's easy to read. This tends to be a little bit handy. Again, not something you need every day, but it's nice when you've got it. Right, let's get to the actual bit that's interesting and what is going on here. So we have, the FPS sucks a little because of recording, but uh, we have some frag lighting and models. Model is coming from ClassImp. Uh, basically, what I've done is I've kind of said screw it to purity for this um, release, as it were, this push to, to master, and I've just thrown in a load of dirty hacks for different things. So, loading models. There are some functions now that will take a class in, that take a file path and throw it through ClassM and give you the meshes. And I've put a couple of functions in for using CL Devil, which is an image loading library. So you could just say, hey, take this file path, give me a texture, or give me a C array that's already set up. So that's there. Um, I've also been cleaning up a few things. So basically, there's a, there's a few things that are hacky, but I've been trying to get the core stuff right. I just needed some real data so we could you know, start playing with things properly. As you see here, um, making textures hasn't really, sorry, making shaders hasn't really changed. Here's our pipelines, the kind of things we'd expect before, defining data and uniforms. One of the things that always used to suck though was you would call this like a function, which is great. This is functionality. That should be how you call it, uh, like a function. But the, this variable here, um, the data variable, you'd specify the type uh, of the vertex data, but then you'd pass a stream to it, which felt wrong. It felt like you were passing a t an object of type stream to something, that, a function that expects um, the vertex type. And so what's actually happening is you're mapping the data over the pipeline. So what we have now is a little macro called gmap. It takes the pipeline that you're mapping over and then the stream and then all the standard uniform arguments. Not only does this make it a little more consistent conceptually, but it also gives me a couple of places where I can do really nice optimization kind of hacky macro things. So I'm really stoked with this and uh, it gmap has a relationship with um, binding of FBOs, which allows it to optimize a few things, which I'm very pleased about. So yeah, this is a very basic example. You can also see down here what is called a swatch, which is just a, a small uh, quad with a texture rendered to it. 
Swatches can be bound uh, like FBOs and just capture, in this case, depth. So you can see I've got a swatch bound, swatch here, and then I just render the whole scene again and capture it there. Inefficient, but I was playing with it, so what the hell. And then draw swatch will draw this quad. So if I take out this line, you can see that goes away. And if I take this out of here, oops, is that going to work? No, unbalanced parentheses. That's very rare. And you can see then the bird is no longer rendering into the swatch, so you can't see it. Notice that we're dealing with a depth buffer. So I've been doing some work to make sure the depth buffer is supported. Uh, swatches are made very easily, so you just do this. You specify um, how big they are in view space coordinates. So that's 0 0.3, 0 0.3. Uh, the texture size itself, which is going to be the same as the viewport. So I've just used the default resolution from, uh, from Keppel. And uh, attachment is the depth buffer. You could change that to be, um, I wonder if we can do that on the fly. Let's try that. Let's set this to be color. Oops. Ah, the only options are color and depth. There we are. So now we're rendering the color buffer to a swatch. And now I'm going to switch it back to depth again. Depth one. Brilliant. So that's the first step, just simple base frag basic frag lighting, which we've kind of seen before, so that's nothing new. Let's look at something else. Instancing. I know I mentioned this before, but um, I didn't really have a good demo for this. I was just doing triangles again, which we've seen plenty of, and even thousands of them is kind of like, eh, I don't know, not that great. So this starts off with 100 birds, and notice how we do instancing, just with instances, gmap over the shader. And we can increase this number. I've actually allocated up to 300. Uh, sorry, not 300. I actually lied. And as you can see, they're all responding well, all being lit. There we are. There's a thousand birds, all with frag lighting. Uh, the frame rate's suffering a little now, especially with the recording, but it's not terrible. Um, there's some depth issues you may be able to see as well, but I haven't bothered fixing it because the main point of this demo is just to show we can draw lots of stuff really fast in Common Lisp. So yeah, that's wicked. Let's go on to the next thing. I'm just going to roar through these demos because there's a few that I want to show and I don't want to be wasting too much of your time. Other than instancing, what do we have? What do we have? What do we have? Normal mapping. Yeah, let's look at the normal mapping demo. So load it in, run the demo. Okay. So as you can see, we have a swatch containing um, the depth buffer again. And I'm just going to drag this around. Notice we've got a mouse control. Actually, I'll show you how that's done. Observe. What you can do is just write event observe. And this is a little ugly at the moment because I haven't actually exposed the symbols in the packages properly or imported them into Keppel. So you can see this event.sdl uh, package name before everything that's down here, which is sucky. It's going away. Um, I just haven't cleaned up yet. So yeah, we can see we, we can observe a particular mouse, in this case the, S, the primary SDL mouse. We can, when we get a, an event, we can check that it's a mouse motion event. We can check that if the state of the mouse button, the left mouse button, is down. And if so, we grab the delta of the event, which is how much the mouse cursor has moved. And then we have a couple of checks to see if other keyboard things are pressed down. So if I hold down shift, you can see that I'm controlling depth. And if I do control, I'm controlling the y-axis. And so we can really have a look at what's going on here. Now, this is actually really simple. Let me go up to the shader. Right, so what we have is, at the moment, uh, the color texture is in this variable texture. Again, I've got to clean this up. Uh, the normal map is another texture. Sampler 2D in normal map. Let me just render that a second to the object. Where is it? Output color. Let's do this. Let's go. Um, how about the texture norm map? And what will we be looking at? Text chords. There we are. So now you can see without actually normal mapping anything what we have. This is the displacement that we'll be using. And this is really hacky implementation. Uh, I'm not doing tangent space normal mapping here. So all I did was just 
modify the actual oh that was a bit odd we just had a uh, glitch with uh, video software so now we're back uh, i'm just gonna have to remember where we were okay so we were looking at this object and i was mentioning that this isn't a uh, tangent space normal mapping so it's it's not proper it's a hack together effect really all i'm doing is i'm looking up into this texture uh, getting the rgb values and using it to displace uh, the actual normal of the surface so let's see I'm going to return back to rendering the uh, color with everything added together. I'm just going to go and turn this right down. This multiplier is the strength of the normal map. And you can see immediately how smooth this object is normally. It is a really flat and boring kind of piece of geometry. So it's so nice just to be able to throw a map on there and instantly get something that looks like this. I mean, this is over the top and you want to be tasteful. And you also want to look at these horrible lines. This was not wrapped well. Uh, but it was very quick to throw together, and as before, these demos are very short. Um, and the code's actually only going to get smaller. Um, there's already some things I'm working on. Uh, the next thing I'm going to be attacking is uh, managing spaces in a very clean way. But as you can see, this is just gmapping over the stream. Another interesting thing about gmap is it will return the current frame buffer that's being used. So in this case, it will return the default frame buffer, GL default frame buffer. If you have bound an FBO, you'll find that that is what's returned. And so that's very handy. It allows you to chain these GMAPs together in interesting ways. And uh, the next uh, demo I'll be showing actually is a bit ugly, but um, it does show how this works. So let's swap over. Let's get back to the REPL. We'll stop this and we'll go to refraction. Let's compile this lock. And go to the REPL again and run demo. And as we can see, there's our bird that we had earlier in the other demos. And we have our brick touristy widget thing over there. But we have a water effect. And this is one that's kind of a, this is a guilty pleasure for me. Because I remember when I first saw um, Half-Life 2. Like, what was it? It was like 13 years ago that they were showing the tech demos or whatever. I can't remember now. But the water effects is something that stood out for me as being like, oh, from the future. And so, yeah, 13 years later, I'm finally doing that in Lisp. And uh, so, yeah, I, it's, it's kind of a little vanity thing, but I've it feels full circle. So what have we got here? We have this bird. And just like before, we had a normal uh, displacement map. This has a little water displacement map. And so all we do is we, we render the scene once, just this. So the non-refractive refractive geometry gets rendered to an FBO, to a texture. Then we render the bird and we look up, we take the frag position of in view space and we use that to look up into the texture from the first FBO. And then we displace that by the uh, water texture. And then we animate that. That's, that's all a few lines, there's really not much code. And so here's the first pass. As you can see, this is exactly the same as the other one. I won't go through the details, but it's just doing a bit of frag lighting, doing too many multiplications on this side as well. Um, this effect makes use of uh, frame buffer objects explicitly. So as you can see here, this is making a frame buffer object. Make frame buffer is quite a, a general thing. If you just have this, it will make a frame buffer. That's fine. But what you can do is you can specify um, attachments that you want to be pre-made for you. So if by saying color one, uh, color zero, sorry, or color is the same, or it's shorthand C, this will go and create a texture that's the same size as the current viewport and will attach it to the FBO on that attachment. So this does a fair bit of work. You can also uh, say that the color attachment uh, will be some other texture, in which case it will take that texture and attach it to the um, color attachment. Or you can stick a camera there and it will take the um, frame size from the camera and use that as the size of the texture it then attaches. So yeah, it, there's a few different ways of using it, but it makes it just really easy when you're in a REPL to throw an FBO together. Like with the inference, a lot of these things are optimized for quick REPL use, for being able to throw together an idea and just see what the effect is. And they say these, the, the normal mapping demo and this demo were all written while the code was running. There was no pausing uh, during this development process, which I'm really pleased it's kind of got to that point. 
So let's go down to where this is actually being used, which is down here. And it's a little ugly, but you can see this is, this is two passes. Um, the first thing we do, we render the scene, we bind the FBO we created earlier, and that's got the uh, color uh, attached from. So we're gonna render to the color buffer. So here we do, we render, uh, just use normal things, we prepare some matrices, we GMAP. As I said before, this is gonna return an FBO, which lands in here. We've then got with FBO slots, which is like with, um, with slots for objects, that allows you to get the attachments. So there's the shorthand. So C becomes the color attachment zero, and that's a variable that you can then use. So I can then grab the texture from that and pass that into this second pass, this E pass, which is a terrible name. But like I say, I was just writing this live, so I really wasn't caring about naming. Okay, so verdict shader, boring. Uh, second one, this is where we're actually looking things up. So here's our little bit of animation. There's a loop number that I'm just modding over and using as a lookup into various textures. Basically, this does exactly what we were saying before. Looks up the data and then composes it together. We can, if we set a few of these values to zero, this is gonna stop the animation. And this is gonna remove the refraction. As you can see now, we've got this straight pass through from before. So we're just rendering what's behind it mixed with a little bit of the uh, bird's own texture. This dictates how strong the refraction effect is. So you can see we can increment this up and if I set it to one, it's gonna be all over the shop. So let's set this back down to two. And then this is the strength of the waves. So again, we can stick this up and it's all over. I just love that. And I know it's a really simple effect, but to finally be doing this in Lisp is, is really pleasing. And the speed is completely admirable. Um, again, these, these cases are fairly trivial. So what I need to do is do bigger stuff and start performance optimizing, but there is loads of room for optimization. It's not something I've been worrying about. I've mentioned in the other videos, I haven't been worrying about optimization. So there's, I've just been keeping a, an eye on it. So I know that there are places I can optimize and that's all starting to come together. So yeah, in the future, what you'll be seeing from me is again, cleanup of this code. So a lot of these demos were made with hack together things. They'll be in a folder called ugly. Um, I'll be pushing soon. And that's just got like the particles and a few other bits. Uh, the FBOs are solid, pretty happy with that. Um, I wanna do more things with uh, textures. So supporting more kinds of texture and all that. Again, we will have the full uh, gamut of uh, OpenGL features available um, for the modern stuff, obviously, post three. And uh, what I'm focusing on next is spaces. So being able to really uh, easily have not quite a scene graph. I'm going to actually do another video on that, so I'm not going to go into too many details now. But um, yes, something interesting, and it'll make uh, managing all these different spaces and transitions between them very simple and make setting things up for rendering very fast. So I will catch you next time. I hope you enjoyed it. Please drop some comments. Thank you for all the ones you have been leaving. It's been very motivating. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time. Bye.